This is a clip of me posing at the leanest I've ever been. It was taken just a few weeks out from the California Natural Muscle Mayhem, where I won the lightweight class, the overall, and earned my pro card in natural bodybuilding. Now, keep in mind, this footage was shot on an iPhone 5S, so it doesn't capture the best detail, but here are a few progress photos from the same time frame at the same level of leanness. Now, the weird thing about this is that I do think that this level of leanness looks pretty cool, and I can't understand why so many people have a goal of not just getting lean, but getting shredded and then staying shredded. A lot of people see fitness influencers maintaining the shredded physique year round and then set the same goal for themselves without realizing the dark side of it all. So in this video, I'm gonna lay out three harsh realities that come alongside being shredded and then explain a better, more practical approach to getting and maintaining the physique you want. The first harsh reality is that when you get shredded, you will look your biggest and leanest under good lighting and when flexing or lifting, especially if you have a good camera. However, you'll most likely look your smallest and most depleted for the other 23 hours of the day. In this posing footage, I'm only 150 pounds or 68 kilos at five foot five inches tall. And while I do think I look more jacked here than usual, I looked much less jacked than usual just walking around. And this is where the so-called natty triangle comes in. Most people get to pick two. You can be shredded and natural, but you won't be big, or you can be big and natural, but you won't be shredded, or you can be big and shredded, but you won't be natural. Now, obviously there will always be a handful of freaks with one in a million genetics who can be all three at once, but for the rest of us, we get to pick two. The second harsh reality is that you may look like you're in your best shape ever, but still not be any happier with the way you look. That's because body dysmorphia is exacerbated at very low body fats. In almost everyone I've ever coached, confidence and body image improve as they get leaner, but only up to a point. Most often, once they get past the so-called beach lean stage and start pushing into shredded territory, a switch flips in their brain and they can no longer see their physique objectively. They start noticing every little bit of fat on their body and get very critical about how they look. And it's only after the diet is over and they look back on their old progress photos that they think, wow, I did not realize that I was actually that lean. And this is a shame because people work so hard to attain a certain look that they don't even appreciate once they get there. And then the third harsh reality is that being shredded comes with unhealthy side effects, even as a natural. This 2013 case study followed a natural male bodybuilder through 26 weeks, so just about six months of dieting. And in that time frame, he lost 30 pounds total and went from 14.8% body fat all the way down to 4.5% body fat measured by DEXA. And this is what he looked like on stage at the end of the diet, where you can see visible glute striations, no low back fat, feathered delts, and so on. And while he placed well at the show, his hormones took a huge hit. His testosterone levels dropped to a quarter of what they were at baseline. So he went from a very high 922 nanograms per deciliter, about as high as you tend to see in a natural lifter, all the way down to a clinically low level of 227 nanograms per deciliter, which would still count as low for someone in their 80s or 90s. We can also see that his ghrelin went up and his leptin went down, meaning he must have felt super hungry all the time. His cortisol also skyrocketed, doubling throughout the diet, and this was reflected in his total mood disturbance, which increased by 617% throughout the diet. Severe sleep interruption is another extremely common side effect, which can be very frustrating. Essentially, your body is doing everything in its power to tell you to not sleep because you need to eat first. And in my experience, this is one of the most brutal aspects of getting shredded. Case studies on women show similar negative health effects, plus the addition of menstrual cycle disruptions and the consequences of that, like infertility and bone mineral loss. This case study on a natural figure competitor found that even 1.5 years after the competition was over, she still didn't have her period back. Of course, not everyone is the same here. Another study found that 72% of competitors from both bikini and figure divisions combined had their period back after three to four months. Some of the variability there could be due to the difference in leanness required for bikini versus figure and whether or not the competitors were comfortable regaining healthy body weight. And sometimes the side effects can get bizarre. It's common for competitors to get complaints that they smell like ammonia or nail polish because caloric balance is so negative that the body turns to protein for energy, which is then converted to ammonia and then excreted through sweat and urine. Even more common is for competitors to do absolutely wild stuff with food. People will watch the Food Network nonstop, watch all kinds of food challenges, hoard cupboards full of junk food, and find things appetizing that really shouldn't taste or smell good. Here's an example. Let me illustrate how crazy it gets. The smell of dog food makes me hungry. And worse than that, the smell of his crap 
makes me hungry when I clean it up. Now, you may be wondering, does this mean every shredded influencer wants to eat dog poop? Maybe. It could be that they're secretly suffering just as much as the rest of us, but looking lean for their social media or for their business is simply worth the sacrifice for them. It could also be that they're on performance enhancing drugs, which can make maintaining a lower body fat a little bit easier. However, even with pharmaceutical enhancement, most people will still suffer similar side effects as naturals, except for the testosterone stuff. Another perfectly plausible scenario is that they simply have lower body fat set points than me or you. For example, I'd guess someone like David Laid is able to maintain six to 8% body fat without suffering too much. I really doubt David Laid wants to eat dog poop. Based on his photos as a teenager, it seems like he's just able to get lean and stay lean without trying that hard. But this isn't common. Most people have a higher body fat set point than David Laid. Now, I need to backtrack just a bit. Body fat set point theory is the idea that we each have a specific level of body fat that our body will fight to maintain. If we get too far below the set point, it pulls us back up by making us feel hungry and lethargic. And if we get too far above the set point, it pulls us back down by turning hunger down and ramping up metabolism. And while set point theory is a good model for a simple understanding, it originated in the 1950s and recent models have updated it based on new science. One of the prevailing ones these days is called the dual intervention point model, which says that instead of a single body fat set point, there are actually two points that each act as a boundary for a set range where our body is most comfortable, hence the dual intervention point model. For example, if I try to get leaner than eight or 9% body fat, my body will absolutely punish me by skyrocketing my hunger, tanking my metabolism, and giving me all the bad side effects we just talked about. Similarly, if I try to bulk beyond say 25% body fat, my body will also fight me by lowering my appetite, boosting my metabolism, sweating like crazy, and so on. But I can get to the lower end of that boundary without too much resistance. And that's the key, finding the lower boundary of your body fat set range. That's what can be sustainable, but this range is different for everyone. David Lade's range might look something like this, whereas someone who's more prone to obesity might have a range that looks more like this. So David Lade could get to 6% body fat and still feel fine, whereas this person might start to feel like death anytime they dip below 12% body fat. So if you wanna sustain a lean physique, you should aim for the bottom end of your set range, but not lower. Of course, you can go lower if you want to, for example, if you have a competition or something, but I would still suggest getting back out of there as promptly as you can so you don't exacerbate those negative side effects. Trying to stay shredded can also impair your ability to make progress in size and strength. People who stay shredded year round have a hard time making any progress. And the longer you stay below your set range, the more likely you'll be to binge, see a weight rebound, and then end up sustaining a less lean physique than if you had just been a bit more conservative with your low end to begin with. Now, for the record, I'm cutting myself at the moment, and that's basically my goal. Hit the low end boundary of my dual intervention range and try to maintain there for a bit. And of course, it's normal to feel hunger and experience some cravings and even see strength loss at a certain point. Those things are expected to happen even if you're within your set range. And it's normal for fat loss to be challenging. But once it goes from challenging to all consuming, you'll know. And I'd say that's when it's time to probably reevaluate your goals and why you set them in the first place. So that's it for this one, guys. Before we go, I wanna thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community that has thousands of classes for people looking to learn new creative skills, whether that be animation, creative writing, video, photography, web design, or even stuff like business, marketing, and productivity. I've been a Skillshare member for years now, and to this day, I still use it to hone my craft, whether that be learning something new about lighting, or camera lenses, or just improving my workflow. Skillshare is great because it doesn't just offer classes, it also gives you access to a massive community of people who are also learning the same skills as you. I actually recommended Skillshare to my mom recently, and she's been taking courses on interior design that she's putting to use in her own home. And if that's a skill that you're also looking to develop, I strongly recommend this course called Explore Interior Design, taught by Demetrius Robinson. It's beginner level, and it gives you six projects to work through. So Skillshare is offering the first 1,000 of my viewers to sign up using the link in the description box below, a free one month trial of Skillshare, so you can start exploring your creativity today. So make sure you're one of the first 1,000 people and get a head start on that skill that you're looking to master. So thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring the video. I really do appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one. Without suffering too much, I really doubt David Laid wants to eat dog poop. Based on... <laughs> I really doubt David Laid wants to eat dog poop based on <laughs> <laughs>
Oh man, that's brutal. Uh, I doubt David Laid wants to eat dog poop, bro. Ooh, I can't even think about that one. That is absolutely brutal. I'm just gonna have to straight up read that. <laughs>